Hey, everybody on YouTube Live and Zoom. Uh, we'll get started here in about uh, 90 seconds, maybe even 60 seconds. So I uh, look forward to having a great conversation with Coach Appert. Everybody on YouTube Live and Zoom. Uh, we'll get started here in about uh, 90 seconds, maybe even 60 seconds. So uh, look forward to having a great conversation. Coach App, are you ready? Yep. Okay. okay. I just want to welcome everybody to the USA Hockey webinar series presented by Pure Hockey and BioSteel. Uh, we got a great guest today. Our uh, U.S. National Team Development Coach, Seth Appert, is joining us. Uh, thanks for joining us, Seth. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate uh, being on here and uh, looking forward to engaging with our fans. And uh, we're going to get to your practice philosophy here in a couple minutes, but I just want to kind of start from the very beginning. You grew up in Minnesota, was a goalie athlete, like, um, you know, the athletes of the team. And then you ended up uh, playing at Ferris State uh, with actually Coach Blaschel uh, from the Red Wings. How was your time at Ferris State um, and with Coach Daniels up there? I love my time at Ferris State. I'm a proud Bulldog. Uh, Bob Daniels has done a tremendous job uh, building a family atmosphere at that program. They've been the Final Fours. So it's, uh, it was a real privilege to play there. I think uh, the best thing he did was survive the appert Blaschel goaltending era. Uh, once he survived that era, the program took off a little bit, but uh, certainly Blash and I are great friends to this day. We're in each other's weddings. Uh, we still go on vacation together uh, with our families. So, so it's been a special relationship uh, that he and I have been able to have that all started back at Fair State. Yeah, that's really cool. I remember the dog pound was always a tough place to play um, there, so. Great little barn. Uh, so how did you get in coaching after Ferris State? Like, what was the whole plan after that? Or was there a plan? No, I think like a lot of young guys, Bob Daniels uh, guided me. My coach cared about me as a human being. I think uh, that's the number one thing I, I, you know, I could take away from Coach Daniels, how much he cares about you as a human. And I wasn't a great player. I was, I was a Division One athlete, and that was it. And uh, he came to me at the end of my fourth year and asked what I was going to do next year. And I, I had no real idea. At 21 years old, and he asked if I'd stay on, uh, stay on um, next year and be a student assistant coach. Um, I learned so much that year. Number one, I fell in love with the the, the position and the the profession of coaching. Uh, I learned so much from Bob and from Drew and Jamie Russell. Um, you know, I don't know how much I helped them, but I know I fell in love with coaching that year. Yeah, it sounds like a very similar to Coach Blaschel's story about staying on and. You know, he was recruiting you guys to, to be coaches. That's pretty sweet, pretty awesome. And then you uh, ended up going to Denver University and was there for nine years and won two national championships with George Gwizdecki and Steve Miller and, and company. How was your time there at, at Denver? It was real formative years in my coaching development. Uh, George Gwizdecki is one of the best coaches college hockey's ever seen. He was one everywhere he is. He's a professional Steve Miller, uh, you could easily argue he's, he's the best assistant coach in college hockey over the last 25, 30 years. So uh, Rico Blasi was there with us for two years when I was a grad assistant. So you just this wealth of knowledge around you. Guaz taught me how to run a program and how to be a leader and, and, and uh, lead young men. Uh, Killer taught me how to have passion and love for the profession. Killer taught me how to recruit. Uh, so I've, I owe so much to those guys. Then we had just really good group of young men that we got to coach uh, fortunate to to coach some great players and great kids uh, that helped us win a couple national championships so winning that national championships i just got a, a question in from one of my colleagues about uh playing small area games to help win is there a story behind that national championship or those national championships yeah in 2004 i mean small area games weren't very big in 2004 and we liked our team, but we were underachieving in January. We had a lot of seniors and, and the reality was, I think they were a little tired of the static way we were practicing. They're probably a little tired of, of Gwaz uh, being hard on them every single day and 
structure and structure and structure. And, um, you know, we had a good relationship with our senior class. Ryan Caldwell was an unbelievable captain for us. And uh, Killer and I talked to him. And, you know, we just kind of – we kind of talked to Guaz about the guys have this here. They, they, they love you and they believe in you, but, but this is all too much and they want to play. And, and we needed to grow our competitiveness and our passion as a group. We are stale. Um, so we started going to a ton of games in practice. Every Monday was a game day. We do games on pregame skates. It, and the, the real thing, it really helped energize our group. I think it helped us play a faster, more competitive style. It helped us have more fun. Um, and real credit to Guaz, because that, that, at that time, that was not Guaz at all. Um, and I think great coaches will adjust to their team. And he made that adjustment, and it helped us win a national championship. Yeah, that's really cool. What did your goalies, you had some really great goalies there as well. What were your goalies thinking about that with Peter Menino, Adam Burko, Dublowitz, you know, some really great ones. Yeah, we, we are fortunate. I think part of goaltending, uh, having great goaltending is, is either drafting or recruiting the right ones. Um, I, I don't know if I'm a better goalie coach than other goalie coaches are. We certainly recruited the right ones and uh, that wasn't just on me. Killer, Killer's a fantastic recruiter of goaltenders. So we had Dublowitz, then we had Burkle, then we had Glenn Fisher, then we had Menino, then we had Mark Chevery. That was the run of goalies in my years at Denver. Uh, it was pretty special. Help, helped us be smart coaches because I know that uh, when we're at 92% save percentage, I'm a smart coach. And when I'm at 89%, I'm a dumb coach. So uh, those guys made us look pretty smart in those years. Yeah, and uh, why don't you talk a little bit about Killer? Because Killer is a legend wherever he goes, and he's a winner, right? Like, he's won at Denver. He won at Providence. He's done a very good job at Ohio State here. Um, just talk about him and his passion and, you know, what he brings to the table every day. Yeah, every day in nine years working with him was, uh, was fun, uh, sometimes an adventure. Uh, he, he's, he's passionate. He's honest, 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 no matter if it's an argument or not. Uh, there's a lot of heated arguments. There's a lot of uh, talking about random things that, and then we circle back. Um, he is such a fantastic human being. He cares so much about his players. He cares so much about the people he works with. And he's the epitome. All he cares about is being part of a team and winning. He doesn't care what his title is. He went to Air Force as hockey ops, right? Um, he'd won three national championships as an assistant coach or an associate head coach and went to Air Force as the director of hockey operations. He doesn't care about titles. He has, he has zero ego. His ego is all about the team and it's all about winning and it's all about relationships. And uh, he's a really special friend. Uh, and I learned so much from him. And, and there's a reason he wins everywhere he goes. And, and then you had the opportunity to coach RPI um, for 11 years up in uh, Rensselaer, New York. So uh, I know that, that area pretty well. And, you know, it's a great little barn too. You know, that's a fun place to play. Talk about your time at uh, RPI. Yeah, it was a great experience. I mean, I was young um, and, and certainly uh, growing through growing pains as a young head coach. I got the job when I was 31. Um, I think I did some really good things there. I think I made some mistakes there. Um, but, but early on, we certainly had some momentum. Uh, we had some real good years, like years three or four to years eight or nine. Uh, we were in the top 25 in the country. Most of those years went to a national tournament, uh, produced, you know, multiple Hobie Baker finalists, some NHL players, some great players like Chase Palachek, uh, really special college hockey player, two-time Hobie Baker finalist. And had great people with me and, and uh, Jim Montgomery, and Sean Kerlack and Nolan Graham, Brian Vines, Brian Vines. I got the coach at Denver, Sean Kerlack. I got the coach. So then I got to have those guys with me later. And I'm proud of what we built there. Uh, like all of it in coaching, it usually doesn't end how you want it to end. Uh, but, but I love my time. I love the way the people of uh, Troy, New York treated me. And, and then after the uh, RPI, you, you took a job with the U S national team development program. You know, and you've had experience in, in different um, international experience with USA Hockey, whether it's the Halenka tournament as the head coach or assistant coach and other uh, your assistant coach for the men's world championships for, for that, too. How's that experience is uh, working with USA Hockey and working, you know, with that USA logo on your sweater? Well, I've been really fortunate in our profession to, to have some great jobs and to get to coach some great teams at some great places. Um, nothing has ever come close to representing our country. 
And I felt that way the first time I got to do it. I remember being an assistant coach for Roger Grillo. He was the head coach of the Lenka that year. He was now one of our ADM managers. And uh, we're playing Russia and they're playing the anthems and you're on the bench and you're looking at it's US Russian for a guy who's grew up on the miracle um, moment. Uh, that was such a big part of my young life. Uh, it, it, it was just really special moments. Um, I cherished every moment I had coaching our, our national teams. Uh, and, and when John Robleski, so when I got fired at RPI, uh, one of the worst professional days of my life, and you're trying to figure out what's going to happen next. And Robo called me the next day. Um, and he asked me to be part of his staff, uh, for the under 18 world championships and to join their staff. Uh, and, and, uh, that meant so much to me to get to be part of that again and to reinvigorate myself and to get excited about the challenge and the passion of coaching again. Um, so for me, putting the USA shirt on every day, getting an opportunity to help mentor on the ice and off the ice, our next wave of American superstars um, is the greatest uh, professional honor of my life by far. Yeah, and I came up to Plymouth a couple of times this year and I saw a couple of your practices and you're running just high intensity practices. And I think this is a, bit, a perfect time to kind of bring up your presentation and, and talk a little bit about your practice philosophy and how you go about your day every day with, you know, some of the, the best youth players in the country. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, again, excited to be on here. Appreciate the coaches that are on here to share today because uh, uh, it's all of you, the youth coaches in the United States that, that end up really being the, the cog that drives the engine of, of American development. So thanks for being on and caring about trying to get better as coaches of our youth players. So this is just our philosophy. And this philosophy is, is, is made through what we've experienced over 20 plus years at the NCDP. It's through my experiences uh, everywhere I've been. It's also using the ADM to learn. So the ADM uh, has done such a fabulous job in our country. And this is science. This is sports science. This isn't just made up. And this is what our countries should be doing everywhere. It's what Sweden and Finland are kind of doing. It's what Belgium soccer, who's number one in the world in soccer is doing. So this is... The, what we really believe based on science is the right way to train young men. So we want to create a high energy, okay, high energy, high passion, high compete, but also a high fun practice. Players, young men and women play sports for fun. That's what they want to come to the rink. They want to come to the rink and have fun. They want to compete. They want to get better. They want to learn, but it needs to be fun. And, and that's a massive component of developing a good practice. We want it. number two, we want to put players in positions to compete constantly throughout our practices. So as many ways as you can, whether that's physical competition, whether that's competition in the scoreboard, keeping score of a drill, a game, whatever it is, we want to foster competitiveness because as a higher levels of hockey, competitiveness is the highest, is the best skill that you can have. And we want to challenge the skill level of the individuals in the team at the NCDP we firmly believe that adversity and failure fuels growth, right? So if we're setting up a practice plan where there's not failure, where they're doing everything right, they're completing every pass, they're never falling down, that means they're staying within their comfort zone. Yeah, you got a question, Cruzo? Yeah, so uh, this kind of goes back, and I brought up Dr. Dean Krelars a couple of times, and he was talking about physical literacy, and you know, you're talking about failure, for these athletes at 16, 17, who are elite or who are very, very good changes for those eight and nine year olds. I just want to kind of remind the, those coaches that, you know, um, making sure that this confidence and this failure is appropriate to the age and the level that you are coaching. A hundred percent. But, but what do we mean by failure is, is, is that the drill is challenging, that the game is challenging. It's challenging is fun. So, so failure is growth, my meaning. And what I mean by that is that uh, if you do every drill or every game and they can complete every pass, they're not being challenged. And if they're not being challenged, they're not growing. So that's where we talk about failure is growth. Not necessarily failure in terms of a loss, not necessarily failure in terms of uh, ice time. We're talking about creating an environment where they get challenged in their skill level and that allows them to grow. Uh, we want to put uh, players in position to make decisions and problem solve. We're not going to set up practices where we're telling the players what to do all the time, right? That's the worst thing we can do as coaches. 
We want to put players in position where they understand the intent of what we want them to do within a team structure, but they're going to have to make decisions and problem solve on their own. That is going to allow the transferability of skills to take those skills that they're learning and be able to put those things into game situations. We want to allow for creativity and mistakes within team identity. Okay, so it's important for players to understand team concepts, to understand what it means to be part of your team. Everybody's got a different identity. For example, at a higher level, the O2 team that I just got done coaching, we were a hard, physical, heavy team. That's how we needed to win. We weren't blessed with massive offensive talent, but we had a heck of a team. We won a ton of games. We won more like the St. Louis Blues. The O1 one team won more like the Toronto Maple Leafs, skill, offense, uh, firepower. So we want our players to allow their creativity and their mistakes to happen for, in practice within the identity of how we want to play. That's an important aspect, but you have to allow for those mistakes and that creativity. Otherwise, they're never going to try to make any plays. Uh, we want to have the practice plan drive the identity of the team. So then we want to take that identity and drive it with our practice plan. Uh, number seven is a big point, obviously, for me and you, Cruiser, because uh, sometimes goalies are forgotten about. But goalies are hockey players. Treat them as such, right? So what I mean by that is that, first of all, as a coach, talk to your goaltenders. There's going to be practices that in youth hockey where the goalies aren't a massive part of the equation in terms of you thinking about them. Maybe a practice is designed more for the players. Tell the goalie that. Allow them to understand that the part of the practice today for you is to be a great teammate for your teammates. But make sure there's a give and take there and you're thinking about what the goalies need at different times of the practices throughout the year as well. I think the more you communicate with your goalie, the more your goalie – feels that you understand him and you care about him, the more growth you're going to see out of your goaltenders. They're hockey players. Treat them as such. Uh, Dave, you have a question? Yeah, and I think you can empower them too. You know, if maybe it's a drill that's more offensive related or something and you ask them, hey, what do you notice? And you, you ask them questions about what they see individual players on their team doing or, you know, what they see because that per per perspective is totally different and also gives them an opportunity to open that communication with you as a coach. So I think that's, and that can start at really any age. I think that's a, a big part of just opening that, those lines. It's a great point because as goalies, I think that's why a lot of goalies and catchers in baseball become good coaches because, because they sit back and they watch the game their whole life. That's what we do. We're sitting back and watching the game our whole life. And you see things from that perspective and, and, you want to make sure the goalies feel part of it, that they're not just back there on an island sitting by themselves. Uh, from a practice allotment standpoint, so uh, this is how we allot practice, okay? 75%, I went through every practice we had this year to get these numbers. So about 75% of our practices are going to be dedicated to skill development, skill acquisition, decision-making and problem-solving, driving identity, and then small games. Only 25% is going to be dedicated to special teams or to structure, right? So we want to make sure there's enough structure, face-off work, D-zone coverage work, that the players know what to do, but we want to use 75% of our practices uh, aimed at the skill acquisition, aimed at the decision-making, problem-solving, uh, to allow them to learn how to play the game and to use that creativity for growth in their skill level. Um, number nine, we practice 80 to 120 minutes daily. So we, we use the quote, win the long game, not the next game, right? So there's nothing worse than you're walking away uh, and you're watching a youth hockey team practice and you got 15 guys standing there and two guys are going and they're saving the legs for a game on the weekend, right? So games are important. We want to win every game, but we're not going to sacrifice development and practice time to try to beat Sioux Falls on Friday night or in the 18 year to try to beat North Dakota in a college game on Friday night. Now there's certain times of the year, certainly we peak towards international events and we might scale back, but scaling back for us is 80 minutes, right? So we're going to utilize that practice time to drive development. We're trying to win the long game. We're trying to get these guys as good as we can be for when they can go on to the NHL and the college, not for everything right now. And, and then, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. So I just want to point out like uh, winning the long game and not the next game, 
Uh, Steve Thompson talked about playing time for goalies yesterday. And the interesting thing I saw last year or the year before, you only had one game on a weekend. And usually, you know, typically at that, that level, USHL or a high level going, you'd only play one goalie. You guys played both. You split yeah. the game, you know, like, and it was like, oh, yeah, you know, like it happens there too. So I think that's, that's to the T winning the long game, you know, given that opportunity. Every, every, if we have a one game weekend, we're splitting our goalies. We, we think it's crazy that they don't play. And, and if I was coaching younger hockey, I would split the goalies every game and maybe even split periods at times. Um, I think ice time should be relatively even in the 17 year in, in USHL games, maybe not international competition. So, so maybe not in a championship of a tournament or something like that, but in the 17 year, we have four power play units. We roll four lines, we roll eight defensemen and we split our goaltenders. Right. So I think that's an important aspect of winning the long game is, is allowing those players to develop uh, and allow their growth to happen. And then the off ice workouts. So we're in the gym every day, every day before practice for a warm up, after practice for a lift or a cool down, two to three days a week, we're going to lift in the season even. And then there's no off days. That's Brian Galvin, our director of sports science. He's, he says there's no off days. There's work days and there's recovery days. So an off day would be a recovery day, a cold tub, a stretch, yoga, meditation, something to get your body and your mind right back on track to get a, after it again the next week. And then the last thing before I go into some of the video is, is, is the thing at the bottom. Practice is for the players. Make sure you design it that way. And, and I feel that this at times in my other stops along the way and I think being here really allows you to take a development focused approach, um, but practice for the players. And there, there's nothing worse for a player than coming to a practice that's designed for the coach. And what I mean designed for the coach would be a lot of systems, a lot of slow talking, a lot of time spent at the board, right? There's not, as a player, I loved practice. I hated sitting at a knee on the board, listening to the coach talk. So one of the things we try to do is every hour of practice we have, I want to be at the board for five minutes or less for five minutes or less for an hour. So normally we practice two hours. I'm at the board for less than 10 minutes. And usually I'm trying to extend that time to give them their proper rest time based on our heart rate monitors. Right. So um, yes, they need to know what they're doing. Yes. They need to know that the importance of the drill or what we're looking to gain out of the game but you can do a lot of those things beforehand. You can communicate with them prior. Um, you can remind them in line. You can coach by moving into lines and talking to players. Uh, the worst part of practice for players is sitting on a knee, listening to the coach talk. So let's try to do it as little as possible. All right, I'm going to move into some uh, game, some practice video to give you a feel of how we would run a practice here. I'm not going to go into all the detail of every drill. It's more about the flow, the pace, the games and the competitiveness and decision making that we'd include. All right, you see that, Dave? Okay, we're moving those. So that we're going to start with a game. So almost every day we start with a small ice game. There's a line painted down the middle. You got two on two going in one end. You move a puck north. Now you get a little transition. So right away, you're starting with offense. I want our players to jump on the ice and be ready to compete. That's why we start with games so much. They're not as physical in nature at the start of practice, but you want to start with them off the bat. A couple good plays. There's a puck in the back of the net. There's so many different elements in, in decisions they have to make. So now you got the D zone puck battle right there. You got puck possession. Now you got a puck hunt. Now White's going to get that puck. They're going to get a turnover. Now we're going to move it north, and we're getting transition. Now the blue team's got a back check. And here's a great clip right here. This is D zone coverage. Now we're working on it. We're playing a small ice game, but they're working on the skills of D zone coverage now all of a sudden. Player's coming in and angling. His stick's on the ice. He's going to try to get a stalled puck. We're going to try to quickly outnumber him. We get in. We move a puck north. We make another good pass, and it's in the back of the net. And you're playing hockey and you're making decisions and you're problem solving while working on skills needed for other parts of your game. Then we'd start moving into more of a breakout game. But as we've learned about how players develop and how their minds work, 
Um, it's important to put decision-making processes in, in these drills. So what used to be a, a three on O breakout drill with zero decisions and us telling them what to do now becomes a drill that we utilize a goaltender for a breakout and we're forcing the players to make decisions. So let's watch this player right here. Let's watch the urgency. First of all, he has to go back and break the puck out as a defenseman with great urgency to go back and support his goaltender. Now he gets up ice and he's shoulder checking and looking north. So now we're utilizing our goaltenders at, in, a, in a breakout drill. Now these players now have to make decisions. If this pass is clean from the goalie to the defenseman, this forward can go north and this forward is gonna support the puck. If it's a dirty pass, if the pass isn't clean, it's on the wall, this forward would have to make that read and go down and support the defenseman like he would on a loose puck in a game. It's a clean play. So now we're gonna put our coaches out there. Our coach might take this guy away and he might take this guy away. So now that defenseman has to sprint back, shoulder check, get a pass from the goaltender and then make a decision for himself. Who's open like he's gonna to have to in a game. And we're gonna to continue to take different options away in a line rush. They're gonna go down, they're gonna play that puck out. We're gonna have good habits. We're gonna stop at the net. And then we're gonna play that same puck. I'm a big believer, you only get one puck in a game. So I like our players to stay on that puck as much as possible in practice. So both forwards stop on top of the goalie. They get that puck back. And now we're working good habits, how we get to the net, how we run the blue line, screening, tipping, all the things necessary for good quality hockey. Okay, so that's a real simple breakout drill that when you've now added layers of decision-making and layers of habits involved with it. Now we'd go to a transition game, okay? So this transition game is one of our favorite drills or transition drill, excuse me. Again, we've added decision-making processes to this. There's a D to D pass and we go to the forward. So the first thing, so now that's the easy part. Now we got a defenseman jumping up in the rush but now we're gonna put resistance. This starts with a coach. So now we're gonna attack the coach. We're gonna find the coach and create our two-on-one against the coach. We're not gonna play one-on-one -on -one hockey. We're gonna kick it and we're gonna drive past them. So the first decision is finding the coach and find your two-on-one. The second decision now is for this guy that gets that pass. Where is the next play? If the coach simulating the defenseman drops back, the play would be to the D, driving the weak side. If the coach stays up with his stick, now we're gonna play behind him. So now he has to make a decision and then there's another decision there and they rip one off the crossbar. I'll give you another look. Now this time the coach goes to the weak side of the ice. So let's watch now the communication. This player right here, look at him communicating with his teammate to go to the weak side. Now we have to find the coach. So again, we're making a decision Okay, we're gonna now activate this defenseman into a line rush by him being the entry man. We kick it wide and again, where's the coach? He's taking the high ice away with his stick. So we're gonna play behind him and then we get a scoring chance. Couple more clips. Now we added fourth man in. So now we've got three forwards and a D right here. Now again, we find the coach. And now we make a decision. The coach sags back like a D-man would sometimes. And now we're gonna either make the lateral pass or the pass to the defenseman. So that's the second decision. Then the third decision is this original man right here is gonna make a decision on, if this guy get the puck, he's gonna stay on the back post. If the defenseman gets the puck, he's gonna do a flash screen. He makes a good read. There's the shot being delivered right as the goaltender is being screened. So we've taken a four on a rush routing drill and we've added four layers of decisions in there with just coach resistance. One more clip of it. This time the coach is on the weak side of the ice. We go to the weak side, we make the right decision. We make it again with a flash screen and we get a great scoring chance. So again, that's how we've went from a line rush routing drill to with no decisions to a line rush routing drill with four reads and decisions. Now we'd go to an up and down the ice drill. Okay, this would be a three on one with back checking pressure. So the, 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 what we're gonna put in to challenge them and their skill level and their decision process is we're gonna put in 
three passes, mandatory three passes. So there's one, there's a second one. Now there's their two on one, there's that third one. Because we know, first of all, making three passes is challenging their skill, but also if we can pass across that royal road, that middle line, if you can make a pass across that royal road, you have a much better chance of scoring on plays against goaltenders. So there's that third pass, there's a scoring chance. Now this defenseman who played that rush, he's gonna jump. He's gonna go in the, with the rush the next time, the forwards are back checking, and now they go down the ice again. So again, there's that third pass, and now is our decisions. Good job of crossing the Royal Road. Now this guy's got decisions to make. Does he, is the trailer open? No, the back checker has him. Is the guy driving the back post open? No, the defenseman's taking him away. So now he rips one off the crossbar. Decision-making under game speed, under game situations. There's a bad pass. So now they have to still get three in. There's a second one. They use the defenseman, he buries it. And now they really start slinging it. And I think they get five or six in here. They do a great job that ends up in the back of the net. Now we would take those and we build on it. So now we did a four on O, okay, against coach resistance with decisions. Now we did a three on one against defensive resistance. Now we're gonna go into a four on two with defense playing live. So look at the white defensemen, both gap up hard to the middle of the ice. So the defensemen are working on their gap control and their sticks, both of them, great sticks, stick on the ice, great detail. Now we're in a four man rush, just like we looked like against that a four man rush against the coach, but now it's gonna be live. The defensemen do a great job, they push it wide and they go attack together. So the forwards do an average job here. The D do a great job and they turn a four on two into a two on two and they shut that play down. Now I blow a whistle, they go the other direction. Two forwards are here, one forwards down here, one of the D joins them. We wanna, we use the term interchangeable parts when we're talking about how we wanna play. So interchangeable parts mean if a D's in the rush, he goes and a forward plays defense. If a D in the offensive zone sees a lane, he goes and a forward rotates back and plays defense, right? So we want all of our players to understand how to do the skill levels and the things that are nece necessary in the situations they're in. So now this is a defenseman carrying the puck through the middle of the ice, leading our attack. He executes perfectly, he carries wide, presents a stick and drives through. Now this is a forward trailing, okay? Nice read there. Same things we're working on against the coach. He sees that there's high ice, he takes the high ice. He hits that late forward. And now let's watch this D-man. Now this is a D-man driving through, who now goes in flash screens, good read, how we want to attack offensively. They go to the back post and they put it up under the crossbar. Now we're gonna start working some games. Okay, I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail on these games. I just want you to get a feel and a sense of how we practice and play. But this is an angle game, okay? Two on two angle. Angling is one of the greatest skills. Probably number one for me would be uh, puck, winning puck battles. And maybe the second skill that you can have is angling. You can win puck battles and you can angle and skate and take people's time and space away. You're gonna be a darn good hockey player no matter what your stick skill is. So it's two on two angle game. They're making plays. They're making give and go hockey. Good little give and go. They jump to offense. They go down and score, blow a whistle. You go in the other direction. So you're working on angling. You're working on line rush defense. You're working on four check. You're working on making plays under duress offensively. Decisions everywhere. And then we're gonna make them play it out. So then they're gonna get a ton of puck battles involved here, right? And it might, I might give the advantage to one team by adding a third guy in if somebody wins that initial battle. Good little give and go, good defense. Great angle there. And again, I've talked about this before, but angling's not about killing people. Angling's about getting a turnover. That's the way the new game is going. So great angle. He's got momentum back to his net. He's got a stick in there. He get, cuts the guy's hands off with his butt and his body. He doesn't have to kill him. It's not about injuring people. It's about getting turnover so we can get on offense. So he won that initial battle. Now I'm going to allow Blue to get a third man involved. 
They win a puck battle. They hit that guy down the slot for a big time scoring chance and they'll continue to play that out. Now we're gonna take that same angling. We're gonna to go to full ice, but again, it's gonna be another game. It's gonna be a game where they're gonna to have to problem solve and make a lot of decisions on their own. We're gonna go three on three full ice. Starts with an angle. You have to skate forward the whole time. So the, the whole time on, if you're on defense, you gotta be skating forwards. So we're not playing slow and back skating, giving other teams time and space. So there's one angle, there's two angles. Now he's got to get back up. Good stick on the ice there. There's the third one. Okay. Great stick on the ice again, protecting dangerous ice. There's a fourth angle. Look at that stick detail. Really good stuff. All over the ice, you're working on closing time and space, angling, taking space away, trying to create turnovers. The beauty of a drill like this is usually if you do eventually, you do a good enough job defensively and you win a battle, you're gonna get rewarded with offense. They screw this one up. Whistle's gonna blow, they're gonna go hard to the bench. We're gonna blow whistle and we're gonna go again. Now a new six guys are out there. Turnover, scoring chance. Okay, good angle right there. Great job being right on top of his guy. Now we get a puck battle. Now you get these decisions that happen in games of risk reward situations. Blue's got the puck right here. This blue guy right here, he's the last man back, but if he jumps, there's a breakaway, right? Great defense though. White has a good stick on the ice and a good angle. So that risk, the reward might not have been worth that risk. And he gets to learn that by making a mistake in practice. You put him in these different situations, they have to problem solve, they have to figure these things out for themselves without us telling them exactly what to do all the time. There's the turnover, there's the transition, there's a goal, good little celebration. We get a new puck in there and they go attack again. Good angle, great edge work, brings it back. They're being creative, they're problem solving, they're making plays. And it's a little bit of free play within structure of how we wanna play. This would be a drill of how we'd work on our D zone coverage. Three defenders against two forwards. Okay. Get our D zone work in here now. But again, it's not five on five static structure with everybody's not moving. There's seven guy, guys involved. They get a turnover defensively. Look at this net front defenseman. He's working. He's active. His stick's ready. He's calling for the puck. We bump it to the net front to work on those little bump plays up to the coach. Then we go to the other side. It's a staple D zone drill that we do. Great habits about how to defend properly in the corner and how to utilize the net front defenseman for little pop out plays. Good job there. We go to another rep and now the other team's involved. Dave, I think I lost my video there, so it'd be a good time for any questions. <laughs> uh, so you were talking about angling and, and battles and how important it was. And I, I think that's an important point to, to make sure our coaches understand. We, we had the declaration of player safety that came out, and I know you had a very good quote on our website about, you know, the new game and like the, the game that's happening now about no more – big blow up hits. Can you talk about, about the, uh, like the hitting and making sure, you know, how that angling is all taking place at your level? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're physicality is always going to be part of the game of hockey. Uh, but I think as, as the game's going forward and especially at youth hockey, uh, we don't want players getting hurt. We don't want play, players that get hurt. They're going to leave the game. Right. And, and um, you hate when you go watch youth hockey games to see, players uh, running around and trying to hit people, their sticks up in the, in the head and trying to run people from behind. And I think we're getting away from that collectively and it's still a physical game, but the number one thing you want to do when you don't have the puck is you want to create a turnover and get the puck back. And I think that's where the game is going. So angling properly, having your stick on the ice, cutting people's hands off, getting turnovers and getting back on offense. That's the game now, right? Putting, putting your opponent under duress, uh, taking their time and space away, 
and and then getting turnovers and getting on offense is is a massive part of where the game is going, uh, where the game is. And I think uh, for us, um, that's how we want to play. That's how we want to teach players. Um, we're not looking to injure players, certainly not in practice and certainly shouldn't be in youth hockey. We just want to get turnovers. Yeah. And I think that's an important point is trying to get turnovers and using that stick, stick on puck. And I know you even brought it up on just one of your little clips, you know, about causing that good stick position. I know that's probably one of your focuses a lot, um, to make sure that we have that proper stick position. So, um, so, uh, another question is on the making decisions part, you know, uh, you're using that a lot. And why is that so important for these players to make these decisions in practice and in games? Well, when the game happens, right. Uh, we can't be out there for them. They have to, they have to adapt. They have to problem solve for themselves. Uh, they're going to be out there for a 40 second shift. Uh, likely the play is going to change direction uh, four five, six different times. Um, they're, we can't tell them what to do. We can't tell them what system we're going to be in. We can't tell them if it's a four check or a neutral zone four check. Uh, so the, the game is in a state of usually offense, defense, right. Or transitional offense, transitional defense, or 50, 50 puck battles. And, and players have to react to them and then make plays accordingly, both offensively and defensively. So if we don't allow them to make those decisions in practice, if we don't put them in those uncomfortable situations in practice, then they're never going to be able to be a, process those things in games. Uh, so just a little bit back to the angling part, you know, after closing the gap, angling and having good stick position, what's the last step or steps of gaining possession? Um, Coach Mike was just saying, it seems like a lot of kids struggle with that last step about gaining possession. What should they be doing? The last step. So if you're angling out of somebody, and he moves it away from you, right? Now you need to get a bump on that man. Doesn't have to, you don't have to hit him. You get a bump on him and then you have to beat him back to dangerous ice. So much of playing fast is beating people back to good ice. So offensively, if I move it, I want to beat him to good ice. Defensively, if somebody moves it, I want to get a contact, a piece of him, and I want to beat him back to good ice. How to create the turnover is when you're closing them, you have a good angle, you have a good stick, now you got to skate through his hands. You got to stop his momentum. You got to cut his hands off with your body. Now you've won the battle. Now, once that happens, you've won the battle. Now you have, if one, and if the puck stays there, you've got to stop. That's a massive piece of it is once that puck stays there, once you've created that stalled puck with your angle, now you got to stop on that puck. You got to win that puck battle. And then you got to be ready to make that next play not uh, having no idea where your teammates are after you create that turnover. Yeah. And I, I think that's an important point. I mean, uh, just starting that angling and body contact at a very early age, we have a pretty good manual. It's called checking the right way that we put out by USA hockey that, you know, the least part about it is the actually checking. It's making sure you're, you're using your skating, you're using the, the good angle, you're using your good stick to try to get in that, that spot. And I know killer or, uh, Coach Miller would always say at Ohio State, he was like, if you're not angling, you're reloading. Reloading meaning getting back to that good ice as fast as you can after you're angling. So I think that's just a, you know, he would always yell at We We do angling every day. It is absolutely, it's just as important of a skill as your ability to handle a pass and make a pass. Um, your ability to angle and your ability to win 50-50 puck battles, once you get to higher levels of hockey, is, is massive in terms of your ability uh, to be a good hockey player, because it doesn't matter how talented you are. If, if you can't take time and space away from your opponents, you never get the puck back. And if you can't win a puck battle, you're playing defense the whole time. Yeah. And uh, next week we're next Tuesday, we're going to have uh, a dissecting body contact, a webinar with uh, Christy Kehoe. And she's going to break down, you know, the timing, the skill, the purpose of the, this body contact, competitive contact for kids of all ages so it's not just that you know the ones that that are doing checking but for all ages so if you know if you're watching this on record make sure you check that out uh, next Tuesday with coach Kehoe um, so I uh, got a next question so you're talking about using small area games or small sided games a lot you know do you have any good games and how do you work on your PK at your level the penalty kill 
Yeah, penalty kill. Sorry. You know what's funny? Uh, we we don't work on penalty kill very much. Um, we we work on penalty killing uh, through these games. Uh, if we're doing power play, we do work on power play. So penalty kill gets to work there. But I think the best penalty killers, uh, the stuff that you're seeing there, um, the angling game, the three on three full ice angling game, the, the cross ice angling game. Um, good penalty killers have to have great sticks. Penalty killers have to be able to take time and space away from people. Uh, the best penalty killing teams don't let teams come in and set up against them. So much of that is taking space away and getting bumps on people on entry. Um, so for us, uh, we work on penalty kill by working on the skills necessary for the penalty kill in all these other areas of practice, right? So the only other things I was going to show in my presentation today, it was only two drills left, I think, um, was two more games. Uh, so in a 12 drill practice, uh, five of, four to five of them are going to be games. Uh, another four to five are going to be drills that require massive amounts of decision-making and problem-solving on their own. Um, so we believe uh, players become great penalty killers. Like we don't work on forecheck. We were an unbelievable forechecking team this year. But our group, our O2 group was an elite forechecking team. One of the best I've ever coached. I don't think we worked on five man forecheck once the whole season, but if you're a good angler, if you do that two on two angle game, great, you're going to become a great forechecker. Sorry, technical difficulties. That was really interesting um, on, you know, the small area games and making sure that, you know, they do a lot of things. So kind of off the coaching aspect side, how would you describe yourself on the bench? And, you know, how did you evolve from, you know, when you first started? Uh, that's a great question. I, when I first started being a head coach, I was certainly too uh, emotionally invested. Uh, I was probably too loud, probably worried about the refs too much. Um, and as you get older and you mature and you learn and you pick other people's brains, um, now you start to realize that those moments, uh, are for the players, uh, train them properly in practice, uh, trust what you do, uh, from your identity standpoint. Um, and I am now on the bench. I'm, I'm calm, uh, very seldom get on the refs. Um, I, I try to exude a level of uh, professionalism and confidence to our players that I want them to take on the ice. I think sometimes if I'm erratic, uh, your team can be uh, erratic. So those are things I've had to learn through trial and error. Uh, I'm a passionate person. I think my strength is, is my passion and my competitiveness and my energy. I think everybody's strengths can become their weaknesses at times. Uh, and certainly at times in my career, it has been, and, and uh, I've made a conscious effort uh, to provide a calming presence for our guys so they can handle big moments better. That's cool. Yeah. Because you, you get a lot of big moments, you know, playing in the U18, you know, worlds and, and all of that. And I think that's super important. Um, how, so you get, we get a lot of questions. We ask coaches, you know, what do you look for in a player that, you know, your favorite player, or, you know, some qualities. So I, I want that, but then I'm going to turn it on the flip side on you in a second. So what are some qualities that you like, you know, in a player? Uh, I like a player to be competitive. Um, I think uh, your competitiveness is, is so massive. So one of the things we do in practice uh, is we keep track of all small games that we play. And we post uh, the player's win-loss record throughout the year. Um, that drives, that helps drive extra competitiveness, right? And we have, we have elite competitors usually anyway, but um, – so competitiveness is massive for me. I think being a great teammate and being a team uh, focused guy, a, a player that's more concerned about winning uh, than their own statistics, doesn't mean they don't care about their own statistics. Of course, they want to have individual success. All of our players want to go on and play in the National Hockey League, right? They, they want to have individual success so they can get drafted and they have those opportunities. But you're looking for players that, that their first mindset is team and winning. And that is more important than individual success. So competitiveness, uh, team mentality. Um, I like a player that, that can skate. We want to be a fast team. So skating skills, especially with the way the game's going today, uh, is critically important. Uh, and then above all else, uh, a player that is smart and is coachable. Because players that are competitive, have a team first mentality, are good skaters, and have a certain level of smarts and coachability, 
their growth is immense, right? So I'll give an example of, of a guy like that, like Joel Farabee, who's now, you know, just turning 20 years old. He's a full-time NHLer, played for us a couple of years ago. He didn't, he did not make the youth Olympic team. So at 15, he was not considered a top nine or 10 forward in, in our country. He was a bottom six forward on entry into the NTDP. Uh, two years later, a year later, he's up on the 18 team as a call up. Two years later, he's a first round draft pick and one of the best players on the team. And a year and a half after that, he's in the NHL as a full time player. Competitive, smart, winner, team mentality, coachable, allowed for a tremendous amount of growth, which took a player from didn't make our youth Olympic team at 15 to in the NHL at 19. That's pretty impressive. You know, you, you hear a lot of those stories about those, you know, quote unquote, late developers. And I wouldn't call, consider him a late developer. He was just a little bit later than some others, right? Like being at 16. Um, so now flipping it on you, how do you work with players that maybe are not, you know, I, I'm not saying your favorites, but people that might be tough to, to work with or tough players. Cause that's, you know, that's real life. You're going to get players on your team that are not, you know, easy to work with. How do you do with that? Well, I think I've gotten better at that and with experience. Um, the reality is you need to get excited about those players uh, because the Joel Farabies of the world, they're the easy to coach. Um, and I think where, where you do your best work is with the players that aren't as easy to coach that maybe don't naturally do the things that as a coach you're drawn to. Uh, maybe that don't have the same personality as you. So you don't maybe mesh as well immediately. Uh, so the players that you know, you want players to have their own mentality. You want them to have some of that bravado and belief in themselves. You want them to have uh, their own thoughts. Uh, a lot of the best players, um, they listen to what the coaches say, but then they make their own decisions on the ice and they own their own decisions on the ice. That, that's a good thing. And so I think as you, if I've, I've gotten more mature as a coach, I come to relish those players and get excited to coach them instead of looking at, that I'm frustrated by them. Um, when you're frustrated by them, nobody wins. He gets frustrated with you, you're frustrated with them, and there becomes a, a wall up between you and you can't connect to them. Uh, my goal as a coach is to get every player to understand what they're gonna need to do to not only help us win, but to enhance their career. That's as a player. And as a person, I wanna try to make them better people and better teammates. Um, and I want to develop relationships with them to where I create, I, I stay in touch with them uh, and I get to be part of their life because you want to make impact on their life as young men, not just as hockey players. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so I got a question from Coach Jason, uh, a couple actually. Do you often practice in two colors for your games? So there's a couple off of that. Yes or no? Uh, only two colors. I, I don't like putting defensemen in one color and then the four lines and opposite colors or four lines and four colors. So we just simply go blue and white uh, so we can play any kind of game, uh, whether that's special teams, small ice games, five on five scrimmage, whatever it is, we just go blue and white. And uh, do you keep them on the same teams throughout the year? I know you're keeping score. How do you how do you work with that? No, we change that because um, some of that's based on the lines around the time. And at the NCDP, we rotate lines a lot because uh, we don't want guys pigeonholed in certain situations. Um, so we'll rotate that. But what it also does, it, it, uh, it starts to show you who's driving the winning. Uh, if you left the same teams that get together all the time, um, maybe it's two defensemen that are driving winning, but the forwards have a great number. Um, so by mixing it up, by changing the lines, by changing the teams, you get a better sense of who's really driving the winning. Um, I'll tell you, like we got a guy, Jake Sanderson's going to be a top 10, maybe a top five pick in the NHL draft whenever that happens. Uh, he was at the top of our group, but I think he was only at 52 and a half percent. So that's how competitive it is. That's how competitive you want practice to be that your number one, two, three players are barely into the 52s and the bottom guys are maybe 45, 46, 47. You want everybody to be fighting every day to try to be the best player on the ice. Is that posted uh, for the teams to see? 
Uh, we do post it. Uh, I'm not sure if I would, if I was coaching youth hockey, um, you know, because, uh, you know, just for other reasons, obviously um, we post it. Uh, we didn't in the 17 year though. Uh, I wasn't sure in the 17 year, if they were ready for that level of honesty and truth at times. Um, and, and we, we did other things to, to coach them and to talk to them in the 18 year. We did post that. Yeah, I think that's important. Depends on your group, depends on the age, depends on a lot of different things. But, you know, having that, you know, group that you can compete and, and work with, I think that's important. Um, well, I'd also say that fun in practice, right? So um, I don't have access to the rink right now, uh, so I, I can't get all my video, but, but I, I would love to have shown some, and I have at the level five, some of the celebrations we have in practice. Um, because you want to create an environment where they care about winning and it's fun. And when they're having fun, they are celebrating with their teammates. I mean, we've had dog piles in practice. We've had guys jump into the glass. And um, you want to allow that. that. That's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Um, and, and you want to see that at your own practices, that they care that much about practice. They're having that much fun that they'll celebrate like they would if it's a game. What, what do the goalies do? That's uh, who I'm thinking about. I've seen Drew Camesso uh, ride his stick off after a big win uh, against Noah Granin. So yeah, they'll, they'll celebrate as well. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so uh, a couple more questions. We have a, a couple more. Um, my one question for you is when you are, are coaching these athletes, how, what do you, before practice, how do, how do you set up your, your day? Like, what do you do? Like, I know they're going to be in school in the morning, but what happens? Generally speaking, the players are in school from seven to, to noon. Uh, they show up at the rink around 12, you know, depending on the school, 1215 to 1230. Um, at that time, I'd like to, uh, you know, maybe be walking through those areas or checking on the lunchroom. And because uh, I think it's important to have context and conversations with the players not just about hockey life how's school going how you doing uh, we might have study hall before practice depending on the day but on a normal day they're going to be in about 12 15 12 30 we're going to have a meeting at 12 50 uh, that meeting might be team that might be four defensemen we might be showing video on ourselves we might be showing nhl video we show a ton of nhl teaching video then uh, a lot of times the goalies are going to go immediately onto the ice and get goalie work in with our goaltending coach for 15 minutes. The other players are going to go in the weight room and get their warm up in uh, off ice warm up. 1:30 to 3:30 we're going to practice, and then after practice we're going to probably lift for an hour and a half, and then any meetings, personal meetings, line meetings, one on one meetings, video things of that nature uh, would be done after that. The guys are very busy. Um, they, they go to bed at nine o'clock. They need to get their nine hours of sleep in. They're up at 6.15. They go to school. They're at the rink from 12.15 till five or six. Um, it, it, they get a lot of things by being part of this, but they, they give a lot as well. Yeah, you, you hear those story, the story about Austin Matthews giving his phone to his billets, you know, at nine o'clock because he wanted, he wanted to make sure he was going to sleep. And that's just the dedication, you know, some of those athletes have. So on the video side of it, how long are you having video for them, say, before practice? Like, what, what's your typical go-to time frame that you, you go with? I'd, I'd like our meetings to be 8 to 13 minutes. Uh, I, I think that uh, when you start getting over 10 to 15 minutes, um, I don't like to be in meetings for, for 30, 40 minutes. Um, you know, sometimes you have to, but, um, but, but you know, meetings are, are generally boring unless they're short and to the point. So we try to be very concise, um, try to get our meetings with the team and in, in done in about 10 to 15 minutes. That is on practice days and that's also on game days. Uh, individual video meetings might go longer because uh, I think it's more of a personal give and, give and go uh, communication where we're talking about their style of play or watching NHL video, but team meetings are 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, I got two more questions. One, what are you uh, doing right now to stay you know, active and, you know, on your coaching game? Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that in the morning I try to work, you know, I'm trying to spend as much time as I can with my family. I have two daughters that are 15 and 12. Uh, so from probably seven till noon or one, I work uh, and then family time after that. So that's been nice to spend that much family time as, as bad as the situation is um, in the morning. 
Some of it's been Zoom calls with our outgoing O2 players or the team. Some of it's been Zoom calls with our incoming O4 players that I'll be coaching next year and or the team. Um, and then I've been jumping on uh, some different Zooms with NHL coaches, American League coaches, other junior coaches, other international coaches um, to just try to pick up a different ideas, uh, steal a few things, uh, get more focused and, and ready on how we want to make ourselves better individually so I can make other players better uh, as well. Yeah, that's cool. And then uh, the last one, I, I prepped you a little bit. And hopefully you had some time to think. If you were in a time machine uh, and you were going to go see Coach Seth Appert, you know, whether at Fair State or at Denver, what would you tell him? Uh, never stop loving your players. Um, I think that any regrets, any times that, that, that the season went south or, or you didn't like the way a, a, the team felt uh, is usually uh, when you went away from personal relationships and you went away from people and it was more about coaching or winning or X's and O's than it was about people. Uh, I think when you can really keep the focus on people and on relationships, and that doesn't mean it's all sunshine and roses. I mean, there's honesty to those relationships, but um, I think the things that, that I, what I'd want to tell the young Seth Appert is keep the focus on relationships, keep the focus on the people and the mission. Uh, and when you do that, usually good things are going to happen. That's, re that's really great advice. Do you want to, uh, we're going to close it down. Do you want to say anything to the crowd? all your fans? Well, you know, just the coaches out there, um, just really appreciate what all of you do for, for USA Hockey. Uh, again, as I said, at the front end, you're, you're the drivers. Uh, you're the people that make this happen. A lot of you are volunteering um, and you're giving your time to make people's lives better, to make better hockey players and to make USA Hockey better. Uh, we get the, the end result of that, the players that have come through your guys' program. So, just really grateful. Hopefully everybody's safe and healthy. And uh, uh, hopefully some of the things that we talked about today can help you going forward. Thank you. I really appreciate your time, Coach Appert. And we really have a great week as well. Next week, we've had 28 webinars so far. They're all on YouTube. So make sure you're checking them out on our USA Hockey page. Uh, next week, we have, uh, I talked about on this, Christy Kehoe. She's going to talk about body contact. Dr. Larry Lauer who uh, is a mental skills performance coach. Um, and then on Thursday for goalie, we have a mental skills coach for goaltending. He's gonna talk about that. And then on Friday, we have assistant general manager for the Chicago Blackhawks, Norm McIver. Um, he had a great career as a player, but you know, has won many Stanley Cups with the Chicago Blackhawks. So again, thanks coach Appert, really appreciate your time. Um, and we just wanna thank everybody for watching. We'll see everybody next week. Um, and be safe, be healthy. Thanks a lot.